And we are back, folks, another edition of the Michigan Basketball Insider. And it would have been great if we could have been talking Final Four, right? I know watching that game, Michigan in the Sweet 16 versus Villanova, certainly felt they could have beat Villanova. Now you look at Villanova in the, in the Final Four, you're like, doggone it. Could that have been Michigan? Right, we know the uh, the next opponent, the Houston game, it would have been a different matchup, but still, you do wonder what if. That's the kind of scenario we can play out with my guy, certainly the my basketball advisor, my big fella, who roamed the court for the Wolverines back in the 80s, became a first-round draft pick in the NBA for 10 years, one of the best basketball commentators, college or pro, in the land right now. And, of course, my man, my guy, Tim McCormick. Tim, how you doing? I'm doing great. Um, I I feel like I've actually been spending more time with with Charles Barkley and Lily and Flo rather than my family. Um, it's hard to get work done, but things are quieting down now. And uh, I, I I really enjoyed the season. Uh, it, it's a good time to break things down. So many storylines. There was tremendous adversity. There was the health uncertainties. They had COVID and they had flu and concussions. And, you know, the roster was loaded with newcomers. They may be younger next year. Uh, there were puzzling losses early for sure. Um, some some eye openers like Arizona and North Carolina. Um, the suspension in Madison. The collapse in Indiana. And, and the nice thing is that this team was able to change the narrative at the end, you know, rather than win, lose, win, lose, win, lose, they finished strong. Uh, did you know, Sam, only 16 teams get to the sweet 16 and, and Michigan was one of them. So that's good. Uh, and once again, I enjoyed the season. It, it's totally possible to find enjoyment and pleasure out of a team and their struggles as they search for an identity um, it was interesting. It was intriguing. And there's a ton of questions moving forward. Um, you know, how do you replace Eli? Um, DJ did a good job. Who's the point guard now? Um, you know, what, what happens with Hunter and Caleb and Musa? Um, th th there was just, there was a lot that went on. There's a lot to look forward to. And, and I do think that, that the foundation is potentially laid for a really good season or, it's possible that there's no foundation and they're starting from scratch with one of the youngest teams in all college basketball next year. Yeah. So I, I sort of alluded to this in passing a little bit last week, we had like everyone lofty expectations of this Michigan team heading into the year, right? They were going to contend for the big 10 crown. They were going to go back and forth with Purdue a roundabout way of getting to that point where it truly was Michigan and Purdue left standing as the best two teams in the Big Ten, certainly the Big Ten teams that went the farthest in the tournament. And they both uh, bowed out uh, and, you know, didn't make it to the Final Four, right? But I, I think the, the growth that we saw from this team, I think, reflected the potential that we saw before the season. I, it just took them a while to get there. And so I, I want to acknowledge that. I want to highlight the the growth that we saw first in Hunter's game, the growth that we saw in Eli's leadership and ability to take over. And then these, these freshmen that had to, you know, pop into some roles that we thought it was going to be seamless and it took a little time for them to pop into. And, you know, those, those roles, while we saw them all uh, play them well as they got into the postseason, when they got into the Villanova game, Tim, and this is where we will uh, go now, Got into the Villanova game, unfortunately, some of the inconsistency that we saw plague them offensively all year reared its head in that contest. I thought that Michigan lost a winnable game. And and the the, the idea is, I, I wrote down a couple notes. Um, first of all, Michigan lacks creative one-on-one -on -one players. We've known that all year long. Michigan shoots less than 50% against a non-shot blocking small team. Um, I think that that missing free throws, they lost confidence because just watching your opponent make every free throw, you know that you're going to have a tough battle with it. Defensive breakdowns, shot fakes. Um, Terrence Williams goes to double the low post and they leave Colin Gillespie wide open. I don't get that. I'm at a critical time. 
Musa closed out high and he gave a, a baseline drive, straight line drive for a layup. That was huge. Post entries were an issue all year. And and that was that was a real problem. You've got a split second, Sam, where the ball's got to be delivered to the hand that's open, and and they just couldn't do that. Um, they they wanted to make Michigan beat them with role players, and Brandon Johns and, and Terrence Williams and and Frankie Collins were two for twelve. I mean, it goes on and on, and 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 also the the big deal is that that the big three of Michigan, and when I say the big three, I'm not saying the best three. I'm saying their three big guys really struggled, and that's that's huge. You know, Hunter needed a dominant game. Caleb needed to knock down threes. And, and without question, Musa needed to be active on the glass, blocking shots. None of those happened. And so I, I think there are talking points that we can learn from the three big guys that really illustrate the issue. Yeah, and so... Again, offensive inconsistency. Now, it manifests in this game different than we had normally. We're talking about, I mean, this team can't throw it in the ocean from, from the perimeter, right? I mean, they just are not a consistent shooting team. What was glaring to me was their inefficiency in the paint in this contest. Mm-hmm. An area that we thought they would dominate, they couldn't because I, I'm like you. I was watching the game and watching them defensively, and while it was maddening to see them leave Colin Gillespie open the times that they did it's like okay never leave him fellas and I think they got that message and they actually did a fairly good job on Colin Gillespie in the game he was four for 14 from the field he was four for 10 from three 12 points I'll, I'll take that mm-hmm. right I thought their half court defense while you talked about uh, you know Musa closing out and giving up a baseline drive you're gonna against a well coached team fundamentally sound team like that, they're going to take advantage of some of those opportunities when you provide them. Most of those opportunities when you, when you provide them, Michigan still, though, didn't have a ton of breakdowns. I thought they did a good enough job defensively to win this game. I'll take that defensive effort. But you got to be able to maximize your opportunities offensively. They got good looks in the paint. Tim, the most important stat in this contest paint points they were 12 for 29 12 for 29 on layups and dunks in this game and i you as a big fella maybe you can explain why because there was no shot blocker in the game and i you know as i go i'm going through the game i'm trying to are they getting sped up Uh, i mean are they getting body what did you see that would explain going 12 for 29 on layups and dunks there's a couple of things sam and and when I talked about the defensive break breakdowns, I thought they played good defense, but I've always said little things make a big difference. And it was a two possession game late. And you think back to, to closeouts and miss layups and miss free throws. That's why I say it was a winnable game. Mm-hmm. So let's go back to Hunter. He missed so many layups. He was six for 16. And when you're jousting for position, it's one of the most taxing things that a big guy can do. You're moving quick, but you're also having to push against somebody that weighs 240 pounds the other way. So Hunter would work his way into position to catch the ball and make his move, and his teammates don't give him the ball. And, and so there was a three-quarter front, then a full front, and then a three-quarter front on the baseline, and, and Hunter was exhausted by the end of the game. Balls that he typically dunks, he missed sometimes that that he had easy layups. He had no legs at all, and and so Michigan did not do a good job of entering the post. They should have run some some simple cross screens, diagonal screens, and know that the ball is going in as soon as he clears his defender. It didn't happen. Um, also inside, man, Musa is exactly like I was as a freshman. The whole year, I had balls that were on my fingertips, and I just didn't quite get it, and it was frustrating. Those same balls with a, a, a year or two of experience, all of a sudden I was stronger, I was more confident, and I was getting those. And I, I think that that one year from now, rather than should I be in the NBA, Musa's not even going to have to ask that question because he's going to be a lottery pick. 
Yeah, I, I don't know if Eli said these words, but I, and maybe I'm projecting a little bit, but I, I want to say there was a point in the game where Musa went up for a layup, and I, I, I believe Eli must have told him, dunk that. You know, mm-hmm. dunk anything two feet from the rim with you're a gazette, dunk that stuff, man. Dunk, dunk the basketball. I think the one that got blocked from behind as they went to a, a, a timeout. I think he was going up for a layup with with that one, and I think that is totally something because he is an uh, he is an unbelievable athlete. He can jump out of the gym with a year of Camp Sanderson under his belt to be able to play through contact, to be able to play through guys bodying him. I think it'll be a night and day difference. Then I then I think he will be dunking everything, you know, within within you know two feet from the rim, but. That was one of those things that you saw in this contest. Just they they seemed to be more physical around the basket. And that seemed to be whether it was with with Hunter. Uh, part of that is his teammates not getting the ball. I don't think they out physicaled him. I think they just wore him down uh, because of all of the physicality. Without him getting the reward of the ball early in a uh, in a uh, in a in a possession. But with with Musa, I think man, they were just able to. To, to really affect him by getting into his body and preventing him from imposing his will with his athleticism. Yeah. John Sanderson is really good with video. And I bet that he's already working on clips, about 20 of them, in which Musa catches the ball and then he takes the ball down to his waist, gathers himself, and then goes up to dunk it. And it takes about two to three seconds for that to happen. What should happen is the ball touches his hand and it's immediately going upward and he's strong enough and powerful enough to dunk it. And so wow. it's instantaneous. So you got to break that down for someone who's never dunked. <laughs> you, you, what, what, you you never, what are you talking about? <laughs> but, you know, the comparison is Caleb Houston's jump shot because with added strength, he's going he's gonna to release it so much quicker. He'll have a whole extra second on his release point. And the amazing statistic, because Musa and Caleb are different positions, different skill sets, but they're the same guy, a young super athlete that that just needs to grow in. You know, imagine, you know, when when a pony is born, their their legs are all wobbly and they're not strong yet. But a year later, man, they, they can go 40 miles an hour. Get this. In the last 12 games of the regular season, and all of those were against NCAA teams, so you know that the caliber of comp went up one time, one time out of 12 did both Musa and Caleb score in double figures in the same game. Yeah. It was one or the other, or none of them, like the game against Villanova. Um, they, they need to follow. They need to follow John Sanderson around every day. And he's going to line their pockets with cash. He's going to help make them so much money. It's going to be generational wealth. You know, people that they don't even know are going to go to college someday because of his ability to transform their bodies and make them lottery picks. It's it's going to be fun to see. I hope we see it. Not totally sure. <laughs> yeah, it's you know you wonder with with Musa what all the considerations are. He has NBA first round athleticism, and maybe maybe some team will draft him on that and, and just make him. Uh, a developmental guy that they, you know, they they pay for his growth as opposed to watching that growth in in college over the next year. But I, I don't know where he is in this thought process. It does not seem like the NIL rules will be in place in time to affect him as a foreign student. It, it doesn't seem that way. Maybe Maybe something will happen quickly enough for it to be a factor for him. I don't know where the finances play into that. That's one thing that we are in position to, to really be able to assess because some guys have to go Tim, you, you know, that some guys have to go uh, because it, you know, there's a need there. I don't know if that's the, the, the case for, for Musa, but if it's purely basketball, Tim, man, I I'm with you. You could really see, I mean, it's a no brainer for Caleb. Right. But for Musa, I feel like it, it's, it, it's maybe, not as much of one because of his his overall athleticism, but still, I, I'm with you in saying you could really, really see 
how he could play himself from being from, from being a guy who people are talking about maybe being a first round pick to I agree wholeheartedly. He's a guaranteed lottery guy if he comes back and has the kind of season we think he could have as a sophomore. Yeah. Sam, if if you go and work out for the NBA teams, uh, it, if you're not ready, it really creates a poor image that can be um, with the NBA teams for a long time. You know who did that? EJ Liddell. EJ went to the draft combine last year, and he really struggled. I don't know. I mean, I love his game, and so I don't know if he just had a bad week or, you know, his calf was tight or – but but I think based on what he did last summer, even though he had a great year, I think it's going to hurt his draft stock this year because the, the scouts remember that. Um, also, when you get to the NBA, you better be ready because it's not a developmental type of league. Like you play game after game after game, and the guys that you're playing against are really, really good. And they're, they're men. They're 28 and 30, and they've played in all-star games. And – and so you can't go out there and just say, well, you know, I'll do my best and I think I'll be OK. Um, it, it's completely different. If you're a lottery pick, they've made a massive, huge investment. They want you to succeed. And if you're in the second round, you're in the G League and you're flying um, commercial, you're on buses, your games are not televised. So there's no ESPN. There's no cheerleaders. There's no sellout crowds. Um, and and if NIL works out well, maybe there's less money. Um, and so it's gotta, you got You also would like to win a Big Ten title. How's that? Yeah, yeah, it, absolutely. I mean, there's there's so many reasons. To, if if the financial piece of it isn't a huge deal, and I don't know that, then then to me, I mean, it makes too much sense to come back and get another year tutelage under under Juwan to and be a sure thing, to be a sure lottery pick. But I, I just I don't know. I don't know that piece of it for, for Musa, but one thing that you could answer for me and, and your position uh, and familiarity with the NBA. So do teams ever look at a guy and let's just use, use Musa as an example. Do they ever look at a guy like that and say, all right, he's not ready now. I'm not going to pay for him to, you know, to lag on the, on the bench and grow in practice. I'm going to draft this guy with the idea of putting him in the G League to nurture him. Do teams do that, or is that not a thing in the NBA? Sure they do. I mean, think about Taco Fall. Ta Taco Fall came into the NBA, and they said, well, he's he's not ready. He can't help us, but let's um, have him in the G League and see what he does and work with our strength guy. I mean, there's, there's, there's 50 guys in the G League that are projects. Mm -hmm. But, I, I mean, I talked to Isaiah Livers. It's not an easy existence. And, and that's why the guys play so darn hard. I think G League players play harder than NBA players because they don't want to be in the G League. It's not, it's not easy. So um, it, it could happen, and everybody's got their own path. And if, those, if all three of those guys say, I'm off to the NBA, I'd say thank you very much for all your hard work, and I'm going to follow you, and I'm going to root for you, and I, I totally get it. You might as well take your shot if, if that's what, what's in your heart. Yeah, uh, it's that Hunter is the most interesting consideration because Hunter can make he could he could set the bar for NIL. I mean, Hunter is Hunter coming back for his junior year would have an NIL gold mine. He could make I I'm convinced that Hunter could make G League money. At Michigan as a junior, I, I wonder what you think about that. So yeah. that, that being the case, the question for you, Tim, is. And this is not meant as a disparagement to Hunter. This is not saying that Hunter can't do it and, and can't be an NBA player. But do you think Hunter next year is an NBA player or is Hunter next year a G League player? I think that Hunter's a G League player. I, I think that his draft stock did not go up this year, even though he did a nice job with his perimeter shooting. Um, I think NBA teams look at him and say that that in, in the positionless NBA today where everybody can dribble past shoot, that that he will be a liability on the defensive end in pick and roll. Um, and I think that they look at him and say his conditioning can still get better. And I think that he, you know, he he can show um, a little bit more of a 15-foot jump shot. 
But maybe the biggest issue is with his three-point shooting. Hey, great job, Hunter. You really improved. I, I can see that you work. There's a huge difference between a college three and an NBA three. And I think teams would love to see him in the draft combine and move him back an extra foot and a half, two feet, and see how it looks. Um, I don't know. I would, I would, I would think that that Michigan could come up with a way to find out what the minimum wage in the NBA, the G League is, and and make sure Hunter gets more than that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I absolutely think they can they can do that. And then I, I wonder if that changes the calculus for for Hunter. Because here's the other thing that you got to take into account as we we move on real quick and talk about you know who's your point guard next year. Some guys are just ready to be pros, and not not, not ready from their game perspective but ready mentally. Like, I, I just, I don't want to be in school anymore. I want to be paid for my growth and development. Some guys are in that, in that mindset, that mind frame. I don't, Hunter, is Hunter that guy? I don't know. Time. Uh, he did tell me before the Air Force game, he said, I'm going to the NBA after this year. So that's, you know, <laughs> if he, if he stays true to that, I mean, I, I kind of expect that, that he would jump, but I could also see why he'd come back too. He's, he's a great leader, become, become an All-American again. You know, do, do something that's going to go down in history, get to a final four. That's that's all good stuff. Yeah. So since since the you know, that picture is still murky about what Michigan's needs will be uh, in the front court. Let's sort of save that part of, of the discussion. We'll see if we can get to it right now. I really want to focus on point guard is. Is point guard solved? It scares me, Sam. Is is it is it solved with Frankie's emergence and with Doug McDaniel coming in, or do you need to go to the portal to get a guy? And are any of the the, the guys we we've heard, for instance, a Sam Sesums? And I'm curious what you thought when you heard Sam Sesums' name. So let, let's let's rewind first. Do you think that point guard is fine? With Frankie and Doug, or do you need an additional piece from the portal? Okay, so first of all, thanks to Eli. Uh, a fantastic career. He put a smile on my face for five years and won so many games and solid, a, a dependable shooter, defender. I mean, just think about all of the defensive calls that this guy makes, all of the times he steps up in practice and during huddles. I mean, th- this guy... He reminds me of uh, Muhammad Ali Abdul Rahman, you know, the same kind of guy, just just a leader that you're better because he's on your team. Also, thanks to Devontae Jones, um, I like him a lot. He was twice on our podcast. That that he gets brownie points. Um, yeah. Nice guy, good player. His role grew, his game grew grew a lot, um, and and I think that the biggest game of the year. He had 21 points at Ohio State. So best wishes, his, yeah. his pro dreams, love the guy. Um, so the big question, who's Frankie Collins? I don't know. He was great versus Colorado State, active D, nice swagger. He can drive and finish. He can pick up full court. Have we seen enough of him to be really confident? Like he averaged less than three points per game this year. And I think he had only two games in the entire Big Ten season over five points. Um, what about his his shooting? I mean, I, th- I think that he was like 16 or 17 percent from three. I, I also like Doug McDaniel, too. Um, but with DJ and Eli gone, the question I would have to ask is, can Michigan win a Big Ten title? Can they get to a final four? with two smaller point guards that are non-shooters, at least what they've shown us so far. What happens if one of those guys gets a sprained ankle and he's out for two weeks? Like you, you can't have one point guard. As a matter of fact, I would rather have three really good point guards because that's the way today's game is played. So no, Sam, I would be scared to death if, if I'm playing with a freshman point guard and a sophomore point guard that to me are very much unproven. What do you think? Yeah, I think you want some more competition uh, at that at that position. And I, I, I guess, and I'm more uncertain 
And it is, again, not a disparagement of Doug. I, I am more uncertain about his readiness for, for major minutes as a freshman than I am about Frankie taking the next step. Like, I was really encouraged by what we saw from Frankie once he got the opportunity. I think it's, you know, I, I think the guys he was around from, the influence of of Devontae Jones as a as a freshman this past year, to what I expect, I, I mean, I think that that guy being around a Terrence Williams and seeing the work that T. Will put in to improve himself and improve himself as a shooter, to, to really show the time on task, having tangible results, I think is good to be around Frankie. So I think Frankie is poised to, to take a step, but that leaves you, that leaves you at a, at a deficit. You do want some more experience. You do want some more size because that that's a lot of pressure to put on Doug McDaniel alone. You're going to need some more size at the position and a guy that can maybe bring a little veteran savvy to that backcourt equation. I, do you think Sam Sessoms is that guy? What did you think when you saw Sam Sessoms as a guy that, that Michigan was reaching out to, Tim? Well, I, um, I actually like him and, and he was a, a, a top spark for Penn state. I, I think that he wants to be a starter though. Right. And that's, he, he doesn't want to play behind Jalen Pickett. Um, Sessoms is a, a driver and a finisher. Um, I, I think he's small. He's got to be six foot, but that would give you that depth that you want. And I would feel a lot better about handing the reins over to Frankie if I saw him compete and go ahead head to head every day versus a guy like Sam Sam Sessoms mm-hmm. and and earn those minutes like where you say hey he's he's better than Sam Let, let's put him in the starting lineup rather than just give it to him and the other thought when you look at the transfer portal and it's fascinating to see how many guys are in there like the numbers growing oh every goodness. single day yeah. um, do you want to look at a shooting guard that that's bigger yes. right like a Brandon Murray or, or maybe um, an Adam Miller at LSU that, that yes. both went to the portal because um, Will Wade's gone. Like, like somebody that's a veteran that he doesn't have to be your point guard, but he can certainly run pick and roll and he can certainly run your offense for some time. I, I, I would love to see, you know, somebody with experience that can be a combo guard. Yeah, Adam Miller is is really intriguing now. He obviously missed the season with an ACL injury, so uh, you you might have a little rust on the top. He can shoot it, and it's like, man, you know, after this past year where there was such a a scarcity of reliable shooting, you add him to the equation, you add Jet Howard to the equation, you add what you think will be an improved Caleb Houston to the equation, and you feel like you could go from something that was a, a clear weakness to something that might be a strength. I mean, I, I would love that. I mean, it's not a, a given that Adam Miller, Adam Miller will come back and be what he was, but man, it's, it would be really super intriguing. Uh, another guy that I wanted your opinion on, he's a different kind of, he's a different kind of guard. He isn't a, necessarily a shooter, but he can get downhill. But it, he'd be another question mark. What did you think when you saw Andre Corbello no. hit the uh, hit the portal? I just I, I just like the guys. I like his creativity off the bounce. I think you know that he could really go get it. That's intriguing to me. But he would not add shooting to the equation. No, I I think that I think that they need that they need somebody that can shoot. Get as much shooting as you can. That's the way that the game is moving now. Um, I love watching. Curbelo, I love watching him play for somebody else's team, though. <laughs> anyway, this is this is the kind of thing that's that's going on. Michigan is definitely looking for point things we know based on who we've seen them reach out to. Point guard for sure. Point guard for sure. They clearly think they need one. So that's number one. We just played the hypothetical, like what would you do? Well, we know they want one. They also are in the portal looking for front court help they reached out to the um the utah valley center fard okay i'm gonna try to say his name fardos imac or amac i think is how you say his name 6 11 250 pounds 18.9 points 13.6 rebounds last season 
number of schools chasing him. Some schools pushing harder. Houston's pushing hard. Um, Gonzaga's pushing hard. They say Kentucky. Uh, he's mis- mentioning those schools before Michigan, but Michigan is one of the schools that's reached out. So not mentioning him from the standpoint of thinking that Michigan is is one of the front runners. He's just one of the schools, uh, one of the guys who says Michigan is reaching out to him. But I mentioned it from the standpoint of confirmation that they are definitely looking for a five man in in the portal as well. I don't love that, Sam. I, I don't I don't like the idea of getting a center. Um, unless, of course, you lose both Musa and Hunter. Um, say you you lose one of them, then you've got your backup. Um, you could add Brandon Johns come back to add depth. I know a lot, a lot of people are not fans. I am. I think he's, you know, he, he's not going to be a scorer, but he knows how to play good defense. And I also think that if you wanted him, Taylor Funk at St. Joe's, I broadcast, you know, six of his games over the last two years. He's 6'8". He's got a beautiful shot. He's uh, he's more of a four, but he plays like Hauser from Michigan State where he can spread the court for you. And that would take one phone call from Phil Martelli, who recruited him to St. Joe's, to lock that deal up. Once again, shooting makes everything so much easier and this is a kid that's versatile, and he's 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 a good ball player. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, as more names emerge from the from the portal. Uh, I mean, you, you're dealing with that at the same time. Look, man, I mean, you know, this is the other thing that we can get into in an upcoming and the next edition of the Michigan Basketball Insider. While that's going on, you're also making sure and you're waiting to see if the staff is going to return intact. I, I really feel like we. We're able to 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 feel and see the input of the assistants more once Jawan uh, was suspended. I'm not saying that that's a good thing, right? That that if he was suspended, I'm not. But you, as Phil took over and started, and for, we we know it, Phil. We know Phil Martelli. We know who he is. He's great coach. We know his head coaching acumen, right? He's a veteran in the game. I think we were less clear on Saudi Washington and Howard Isley and what they bring to the table as, as coaches, what, what their specific input is. And when Juwan was out and Phil is really highlighting, Hey man, I'm not calling offensive plays. That's Howard. You know, I'm, he said, I'm not the X's and O's guru. Like, like he and like him and Juwan. So he's calling all this. So you get a feel for Howard Isley's input on the team. And then same thing with Sadie Washington on the defensive end. Hey, this is Sadie's defensive adjustment. He made this call. And so you're getting a feel for that. As that happens, schools start to hear. Schools start to listen. They start to see these are appealing guys. And so they become more in demand. The calculus for them becomes, you know, do I go and take a a low-level program and try to build it up? Or am I at the point at Michigan where this program is rolling? Uh, my my input is is clear. This is part of my career advancement. Uh, staying here, that that can still happen. And you keep those guys in there. We're in that window, in that pocket of time where that's being worked out too. To sort of feel like, hey, is the staff going to return intact? I'm kind of feeling like it's likely that it will. I know there's a lot of talk out there about them being in the crosshairs of some programs, but I'm feeling like Michigan has finally put itself in a position, pay scale wise for assistance and put itself in a position when it terms when it comes to validating their input wise as well. John Beeline did a good job of that and so is Juwan Howard making those guys feel like they can contribute here and promote themselves for their there wherever there is as a head coach as well. So those all those parts are moving at this point in time, Tim. I am um, I think the Michigan's coaching staff is as good as any in college basketball and it's just a question of you want your shot at some point to see how you can do. And as an example, Saudi Washington is one of my favorite people, one of my favorite coaches. I think he is immensely talented. And and you know that Western Michigan's job is open. That's his alma mater. My son played there. I know how loved he is. So it's a question of as much as he loves Michigan, does he want to take that shot? And it's it's a pretty darn good job when you consider you've got the whole West part of Michigan you're not far from Chicago. They have been so bad 
that that you can turn it around quickly. And who could turn it around? Somebody like Saudi that has been, you know, looking at the portal for Michigan. He has relationships with guys he's recruited. I think he'd be an a, unbelievably good candidate there. Um, but I also love the fact that he stayed in Michigan and helped us win. Yeah, and he stayed at Michigan the last time the Western Michigan job was was open. And like I said, I, I think I think Michigan has has positioned itself where that's not a no brainer decision, especially when you, I mean, look, say what you will about about the Mac and say what you will about Western. I mean, that is, you know, you got to have some risk assessment as a as a coach and the, especially as an African-American coach. Do you how your first opportunity ha- it can be your last one if it doesn't go well. So you really have to think hard about the likelihood of success. Part of that comes from the commitment of the institution, the commitment of the conference to basketball. Do you see that at Western? It could be the case. I mean, are they at a, at a point financially where they can su- substantially increase his salary from what it was here? And it's not necessarily just a salary thing as much as it is a commitment to the program thing, because that needs to be built. That needs to to grow. I mean, you're getting paid now at Michigan, like uh, head coaches in the Mac used to be paid. Uh, or you, head coaches in, in the Mac used to be paid back in the day, right? Well, now, uh, you know, those those salaries are, are comparable. That salary in the Mac is still pretty much the same. Salary at Michigan has risen to that level. So it's harder to get those guys to leave unless you're going to say, Hey, you're making X here at Michigan. We're going to pay you two times X to come to to Western. I don't know if Western is is in that place. And I think Saudi that has to be in Howard if he's in a sim- similar situation. Something they have to think long and hard about as they decide whether to go or stay. And I frankly I think that we we're going to have at least one more ride, one more merry-go-round turn with this great assistant coaching staff here in Ann Arbor, and it's, it's thanks to, in part, working for a great boss in Juwan and, you know, them paying their assistants in ways that makes it harder for them to be poached. I remember, I still remember when Mike Jack left Michigan to go be an assistant at Purdue. That should never happen at a place like Michigan. No too. doubt. And I, I I think that that um, Saudi has stayed around because he loves Michigan, but his daughter was finishing up her, yeah. her gymnastics career. Yeah. That's significant. I think she's going off to college now. Western Michigan needs to build a practice facility, but I think they also received a $50 million grant. Look at us breaking down the math. <laughs> hey, Sam, um, yeah. I, I, I want to continue the, the breaking down the positions. I thought it was really interesting what we talked about with the point guard. Is Kobe Bufkin your, your shooting guard next year? Do you feel comfortable going? I know we talked a little bit about you know, the LSU guards and there's other options, but what, what do you think about Kobe? So, so here's, what I, here's what I know. So you're my big fella. My, I, I got a coach on the sideline named Michelle McCormick. And Michelle <laughs> McCormick is like, hey, we got, we got time to keep. I'm, I'm looking at my time, and yeah. I'm saying, we got to meet this time. So okay. I, don't want, I don't want Coach McCormick to be mad at me. So here's what we're going to do. I want to tell you, I still believe Kobe is going to be a big-time player. Do I believe Kobe is your shooting guard next year? We're going to get into that on the next edition. Oh, nice lead. The Michigan, <laughs> the Michigan nice basketball lead. insider. That's how we're going to do that one, Tim. So, no, we're going to keep it tight. But we wanted to make sure that we got in and we did some reflecting on the game. And, look, it may not have ended. They may have lost a game that we thought was winnable. But that doesn't, that doesn't um, you know, overshadow the progress that we saw and certainly the fight that we saw at the end of the season. That team could have mailed it in, uh, and they didn't. They fought their way to the second weekend. And that's not something that I think as the season unfolded, anyone, you know, many of the pundits thought that they could do, and they did it, Tim. Sam, you're exactly right. And there's only one team that walks away and says, man, that was great. We we did it. We lived our dream. Um, to get to the Sweet 16 is excellent. And, and, and I believe strongly in Juwan that he's going to, He's going to find a way that makes us excited for next year. You know, there's going to be more shooting. Um, There's a ton of depth on the front line. And small forward is going to be really interesting. 
Uh, I I enjoyed the year, and I enjoyed being with you, Sam. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll talk Kobe Bufkin. We'll talk uh, wings in the portal. We'll break all of that, that freshman impact that we think is going to come at that position. A lot to get into on the next edition of the Michigan Basketball Insider. Thank <laughs> you.